My name is Alexis Davis. I'm the social media manager here at RCSA. I'm joined by Jim Broach, executive vice president and director of RCSA, and tonight's guest, Dr. Steve Aarons. Dr. Aarons has spent 52 years as a licensed pharmacist. Having a wife with chronic pain, Steve has been forced to deal firsthand with a system where those who complain about chronic pain are viewed with a great deal of skepticism. He has been running a blog via pharmacyststeve.com for the past decade. And from what I hear, a lot of you are familiar with it and have checked it out. So that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and so tonight's conversation is going to be a little different. It's going to be very interactive. And we're looking forward to seeing your questions regarding navigating the healthcare system in the chat. So therefore, be sure to share your questions in real time throughout the entire conversation. And as always, remember that while the information shared here tonight is helpful, please consult your physician for personalized medical advice. So before we get started, Jim, do you have any announcements? I know we have so much coming up with our ZSA. <laughs> Not really. I, I'm just really excited that Dr. Steve is with us. I've been following him underneath the dark clouds of the CDC guidelines for a long time. And um, I'm excited that he's here because he's got a lot to, lot to tell us, teach us, and to really be in our corner. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, yeah, I know we have a couple of events coming up and I'll definitely pull up some of that information at the end, including our virtual walk and things of that nature. But we'll go ahead and get started. So Dr. Aarons, I know this is a loaded question, but talk to us a bit about your experience and your wife's experience with chronic pain over the years. Okay. Well, we started dating in the fall of 65. There was... Um, uh, a couple years earlier, she'd had uh, rheumatoid, uh, uh, rheumatic fever. At that point in time, it was thought that a female who had rheumatic fever would end up with rheumatoid arthritis. So we now look back and go, okay, we thought what, which was rheumatoid and it wasn't, it turned out to be fibromyalgia, uh, which wasn't even a known entity back in, back in the day. <laughs> it was uh, referred to as a uh, whining women's syndrome. Um, but uh, it's been, uh, we've had to fight the system uh, just like everybody else does. And um, there are no shortcuts and there's no um, open doors. Uh, you, you have to nudge your way in and, and fight for yourself and, and stand up for yourself to, to get things taken care of. We, we right now have a pretty good uh, healthcare team and my wife has a, is had is on her third implanted pump. The batteries last about six and a half years. So she's in the year 15 or 16 on this one. I don't remember. Time flies when you get old, you know. Um, so, um, but as I said, giving, given her age and her various illnesses, she's probably being taken care of as best as could be expected. Alexis, may I start it off with a question? Yes, I was just about to jump in. Okay, so so Dr. Steve, I, so RSDSA um, has received questions about denial of care from pharmacists and from doctors for years, regardless of the chronic pain syndrome. So my, my first question to you is, if a pharmacist refuses to fill a script or fills only portion of that script, what can you do? Um, the recommendation I usually give people that ask me that on my, on Facebook or on the blog is I've got a link to, um, from a national community pharmacist association that will look up an independent pharmacy by zip code, because there you're dealing with, um, normally the pharmacist owner who tends to be less judgmental, uh, staff very seldom turns over very little. So you're never walking into a new pharmacist or a new technician or what have you. Um, and um, it, as I said, I had my own store for, for 20 years. I, I know the mindset behind the, the people that own these stores. And uh, it's, it's a whole different mindset. And I have very, very seldom had anybody come back to me that, that moved to, to an independent pharmacy and say it was worse. And there's been one or two episodes, but over 10 years, one or two episodes, which is not a lot. Um, I just had, a, I just had a, um, an email tonight from somebody that uh, went to the pharmacy and decided that uh, um, 
she said it was a new male technician. I think it was probably a new male pharmacist that was feeling his oats and um, said he wasn't going to fill it for any more for her, but she'd been filling it for 20 years and wanted to change. Um, these pharmacists get, there's, there's, a, there's a phrase in the Controlled Substance Act. It's called corresponding responsibility. And, and corresponding responsibility is supposed to be a two-way street. Um, it's supposed to be make sure that you get, don't get the, a, a, a dose in the wrong hand and make sure you get a dose in the right hand. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of people in, in, in pharmacists in particular and law enforcement always look at the fact, well, I didn't get a dose in the wrong hand. Um, but if I didn't get that dose in the right hand, well, it was no, it was no big damage to me. I didn't, I don't, there's no consequences to me as if I had a dose in the wrong hand. So they, they kind of take that kind of attitude that it's, it's collateral damage is, 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 is tolerable as long as it doesn't involve them. So uh, th that's where you're getting them at. And some of the, some of the, the cross the board in medicine, I graduated in pharmacy school in 1970. I'm, I'm uh, what's commonly referred to as a, as a um, I even forgot the term now. I'll think of it later. Anyway, I was taught, I was instructed to deal with the patient. These new medical professionals are taught to deal with tests. Well, if you're dealing with a subjective disease like pain or anxiety or depression, there are no tests. Um, and so they really don't know what to do. Um, you know, and, and they don't act, have access to the patient's medical records from the doctor's office. And some of them get bold enough to ask for a, for a, for a film, uh, x-ray, CAT scan, MRI. And I tell the patients, I says, well, give them the film. Just don't give them the radiologist's interpretation of the film. Let them figure it out. Uh, <laughs> They, they ask for the film, give them the film. It's what they ask for. Um, so sometimes um, you just have to be a little pushy. Um, and and um, I've always had, with, with pharmacists, I've always had the advantage that I was a pharmacist and the pharmacy community is fairly small. Uh, even now today, uh, there's only a, probably about 300 active licenses, 300,000 active licenses. So um, that's a pretty small fraternity from, from a standpoint. And uh, um, if I get into one where, where I, I, we had a condo in Florida and we sold it last, last year. And one of the pharmacists at the local Winn-Dixie is to a condo. Also, at one time, had to be a, had his own twelve stores. He was an independent, and so that fraternity got even a little smaller. That you have pharmacists who are owners. That's a whole different mindset and a whole different fraternity. And so, me and him got along just fine. <laughs> so, um, but it, it's just the boards won't do anything. The chain pharmacists, the chain corporations won't do anything. There was a there was an article in uh, USA Today, um, maybe 10, 11 years ago, and I'm trying to think of the author's name, um, but the, the article was- let, let me interrupt you. So, so basically you're saying that find an independent pharmacy rather than a chain and you that's, have- that's, 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 pretty much, that's pretty much it. And, and this article was how the, the majority of the boards of pharmacy were stacked with non-practicing corporate pharmacists. So, you know, they're going to protect themselves. Um, so, you know, it, 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 you can file a complaint with the board. Now, one thing people can do, and I had to do this with the hospitals, my wife, uh, in, in Indiana, we have the option of filing a complaint through the AG's office and not go directly with the medical board. And that way, the medical board, the pharmacy board, or the nursing board, or whatever board, the, the, the AG is the lawyer, the attorney for all the licensing boards in the state. And that way they don't get a chance to uh, toss it in, in the circular file. 
now, <laughs> now someone actually did just ask if you maybe don't have an independent pharmacy or a compounding pharmacy in your area, do you have any recommendations on the best chain pharmacy or are they all kind of similar when it, it comes just, to health? It just depends who's, who's there. You know, generally speaking, the old, older pharmacists tend to be a little more liberal. Uh, the young ones are, are so afraid of losing their license, which they'll never do. Um, but but uh, another thing that they can do, if there's, if there's not one real close, but there is one, say, 20 miles away, talk to the pharmacist about syncing up your meds so you get them filled once a month on the same day. That way, you make one trip a month in instead of probably one or two trips a week. So that compensates for the time and trouble. A really good idea. Especially we know we have a lot of warriors who maybe have to travel for doctor's appointments on certain days of the month. So then you can kind of do everything at once. So and and if they, you know, if if they know you're coming and they know what meds you need, you know, um, generally speaking, and I, I know more about the independence than I do the, the chains, how they how they work it. Um, with a C2, pharmacy can generally get the meds Monday through Thursday the next day. Uh, anything after their cutoff period uh, on five, six o'clock on Thursday night won't show up till Monday. So um, uh, call them a couple of days ahead of time. Tell them what you're, you know, hey, I'm, I'm coming in in three days, four days, and you got a list of meds I need. Here they are. I'll, uh, the doctor's going to send in an electronic C2. All right, Jim, I'm going to jump into the big question. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts about, uh, excuse me, no, that's not the one I wanted to jump into. Sorry about that. Um, talk to us a bit about your reaction to the latest CDC guidelines um, for chronic pain. You want the short answer or the long answer? <laughs> Well, we're, we're in public air, so maybe the one. <laughs> <laughs> They're crap. And that that um, Supreme Court hearing today, the Department of Justice people were already talking about and trying to apply the new proposed guidelines into arguing this case. And they got, what, another 45 days of comment period? In the, and that what's left on the comment period on, on those proposed yeah, I think guidelines? It was April. But do me a favor, just talk about that case because it was before the Supreme Court today and that will shed some light on this issue. Yeah, the, this, this was a doctor who was supposedly a very well-educated, highly, three specialties, I think. And uh, the this was just the hearing before the, the Supreme Court today. And they the, the the justices made the comment that the, the Controlled Substance Act was kind of vague, and you know it it well while it is the law, its interpretation of the DEA has been rather vague as well and very broad. And what I read pretty much concluded that the justices were on the side of the doctor that he got railroaded. Uh, into a 20 or 21 or 25 year sentence. And so uh, if this thing comes down with the Supreme Court this way, um, there's going to be a lot of appeals um, down the line of all the doctors are sitting behind bars right now um, because the, the DEA has, in my mind, if you... You look at it as long as I've looked at it, they've went from looking for dead bodies and and diverters um, and you know the 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 all the oxydocs that were in Florida because Florida in in the, the uh, early 2010 2000 that, that decade uh, Florida I don't think had a had a PD, PDMP PDMP then. And they supposedly had a couple hundred what they called oxydocs, and they were sent, they were writing prescriptions for money, and 
apparently uh, uh, um, the governor then, uh, um, you know, he's senator from Florida and never can remember his name. And Pam Bondi, the AG, apparently cleaned house in during their first four-year term down there. Um, I expect this. I expect this thing to be to be published without a word changed in it. Uh, I expect that the the uh, DEA will uh, latch on to that. It mentions 50 MMEs, and I think at least once, and uh, they'll latch onto that. And then they start talking about standard of care and best practices. And that's what they're going to go at, because when they arrest doctors now, as I said, they're no longer going for dead bodies um, or overdoses. Um, they're just saying that they avoid they they violated uh, medical practice act the medical practice which they never they never decide they never claim what it is that they violated and um, I've been looking at some stuff right now um, chronic pain is let me, let me back up a second. I was dealing with, with uh, home IVs and, and, and C2s and in-state cancer patients in the 80s. Um, MMEs wasn't really, there were ratios there that do the same thing there, but they weren't, they weren't addressed as MMEs. I cannot find any evidence of a study where those MMEs came from. So I think it's my opinion that those things are pretty much wives' tales that have turned into junk science that the DEA has hung their hat on. Um, because I know back in, in, in the 80s, uh, our DNA was not fully mapped yet. We didn't know about uh, the CYP450 liver enzyme system. Uh, that metabolizes uh, the opiates. And um, this week I've been looking at some uh, C2 FDA prescribing guidelines, what they, look, what they give pharmacists in the bottle with, with the medication. And I've done some word searches and NMEs are not even mentioned in the, in the medication. So the, the DEA, the, the, the FDA never was behind these MMEs. So where did they come from? I know it was stated with the 2016 guidelines that the studies that they used were uh, most were rated a three or four on a scale of one to four, where one is good or excellent quality of, of data and outcomes, and three and four was pretty well crappy. Um, so those whole guidelines were, were based on faulty data, faulty studies. And if you look at the, the proposed guidelines, they say they use the same scientific data, data and the same scientific processes to come to the new, to the new proposal. Yeah. Uh, that that's kind of reminds you of Einstein's you know, uh, definition of insanity. Yeah. Keep doing the that's same thing right. over and over again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're pretty well dialed uh, into the community. Do you know of any class action shoots that were uh, that are being fomented, or <clears throat> the, the only the only suits that, that that I know is one where a, a, a patient committed suicide in Louisville, Kentucky, back in eighteen, and uh, in fact that that clinic is about twenty miles from me, um, and um, the wife. And the daughter got seven million dollars. What was right. really, what was really, I was expecting this to happen. It's the first time I've seen it happen. Of that seven million, three million was allocated to the daughter for loss of companionship and consortium. And uh, I've been saying for years. I said, when some family comes after a prescriber because the patient with suicide because their meds were cut, and they get get hit with a, a a loss of companionship and consortium by the wife or the kids, they're going to get really blindsided on that one, and they won't have any defense for it. Um, there was another one, I think it was in Virginia, it was a, it was a Veterans Administration, and the mother got a million dollars for her son committing suicide in the parking lot of the VA building. Um, 
I think I think the legal the legal avenue is where it's going to end up. You know, the the, the they claim that forty percent of, of Congress are attorneys, and attorneys, you know, they're in to enforce the law or get their their, their client off from the law. So, you know, the, and there's there's this is somewhere in excess of $100 billion a year we spend on the war on drugs. That fills an awful lot of paychecks. And those paychecks start down at the cop on the street and go all the way up through um, the, 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 the local courts, the state courts, AG, state AG, all the way up at DOJ. And there's a lot of paychecks in um, 40% of Congress, which would be you know, about uh, 535, 40%, 200 and, uh, 207 or whatever it is, are, are part of that judicial fraternity. They're probably not going to do much to harm their fraternal brothers and sisters, their jobs. Um, I think one place that, that nobody's lawyers, law firms, tend to like to go down well, well beaten paths to a pot of money. If you notice the, the, the TV ambulance chasers, uh, they're all, they all get about four or five different paths they go down. Nursing home, big trucks, car wrecks, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but when you get to a lot of these, a lot of prescribers are now just employees of a large hospital corporation. Uh, and they're being dictated to how to practice medicine. Well, I, I don't think the hospital system could get a medical degree nor get a license to practice medicine. And the Controlled Substance Act says that, that you can only prescribe controlled substances for a patient you, you have done an in-person exam. And so, um, and deprescribing falls under that category. And deprescribing means you cut their meds. Um, it's, it's it, there's, there's also a, an issue when you go to the doctor and, and they go, oh, you're, 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 um, your blood sugar's out of range. It's, it's, over, it's over 120 or 140 where they want to cut it at. And you're probably not type two, di type two diabetic if you're someone our age. Uh, so they'll start with an oral hypoglycemic. But they don't start them with an oral hypoglycemic with a point that they're going to have to stop at some point in time. They're looking at moving that blood sugar back to was an acceptable level. With, blood, with, with pain, we don't look at moving the pain back to an acceptable level. We're going in a, at a dose, we've, we've got a dose limit. And in fact, this is probably the only chronic illness, chronic disease that is latched to a, a dose limit before you even start. I think, and, and I talked to so many patients because they have blood pressure cut, I mean, their pain medicine's cut, their blood pressure goes into a hypertensive crisis, uh, they're subject to a to stroke, heart attack, eye damage, kidney damage, for starters. And the doctor, we're gonna put them on four different categories of any hypertensive medicines, and it still doesn't go down, but they just fold their hands. Well, you know, they, they always said the high blood pressure is a silent killer. So what they're doing is somebody dies of a stroke or a heart attack or eye or kidney or whatever. Well, that was just a premature death. So you, you, you have no, nothing to really hang any defense on. Or, or right. On. I do have a question that just came okay. up, something you kind of just mentioned. Um, so this question is regarding the CDC guidelines, suggested guidelines, I should say. Is it reasonable to say that many providers in varied capacities choose to cherry pick or fail to truly read them in their entirety? Um, this person is saying that there seems to be a wide variance in the interpretation and application of the guidelines. Is that safe? Well, to the, 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 the other one I think was 40 some odd pages, the, the 2016, and this one's 211. Oh, uh, so the, 
so there's a lot more words in there. With the with the 2016, I said over and over and over again that that, that some entities, some practitioners, hospitals, whatever, were finding their favorite sentence paragraph or page and going, oh, there it is. I'm following the guidelines. You know, and usually that sentence paragraph or page had 90 MMEs in it somewhere. So uh, it is, I've had some law firms sniff around contacting me. None of them are ready to pull the trigger yet. So it's just, but I think if we can get, um, if we can get a, 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 a new hospital system or, or somebody that's just taken over a hospital system, just put out some edicts about limits of what they can or can't prescribe, um, that should be a point one for, because the, the, the hospital system probably has pretty deep pockets. And that's what attorneys go for is, is pots of money. And to date, um, no one, no one fears the patient. They all fear, fear the DEA. And that's until, a quote. If, huh? I said, that's a quote. Yeah. Until they start getting some fear and, and, and digging and taking money out of their deep pockets is fear. Nothing's going to change, you know, and, and writing letters to congressmen. And, um, you know, there's another thing I've been trying to reach my Senator for about four weeks now and can't get past anybody and they were they answer my phone well i can get back somebody get back with you never do but with medicare about, uh, about five years ago they started looking at um compliance on three different disease states diabetes cholesterol and high blood pressure well what is showing up with me as these pain meds are being cut the pressure is going up the um, uh, even the doctor adds four different categories of antihypertensives are still up, and but HHS, CMS, Medicare, whoever, it's all monitored through the PM, PBM. Is the patients getting these medications for, for blood pressure, and the patients getting them filled regularly for blood pressure, and so everybody's happy because they think the doctor's doing their job to control their high blood pressure. And the whole process was to save Medicare money by managing their blood pressure, but they're not doing it. So, you know, huh? No, I've got to finish your thought. We're just going to go on another question. Okay. okay. So you mentioned something about, of course, you know, things really may not change, you know, in the future, but something that I know that's been, a, you know, talk of the town in this world is, of course, Mark Cuban, as you know, started a pharmacy with discounted drugs. Want to know, do you think this is going to work? You know, if other people do this, is, you know, are other big pharmacy companies going to be threatened? Like, how long do you think it's going to last? Well, Cuban's only stocking 100 or 200 drugs, I doubt if any of them are controls. Um, there's, I don't like mail order from the very, anybody who has an OTC bottle of something or other, look in there that what the, what the temperature storage range is for those things. And it's usually between about 55 and 85. And I don't know any UPS truck or FedEx truck or mail truck is within that temperature range delivering your medicine by mail. And I saw, I've saw some price comparisons to Cuban and at, at best it's a few pennies less and at worst it's a few pennies more than the local, local pharmacy. So Dr. Steve, talk to me about that so often now um, this prescribing pain specialists might give you a choice of an opiate or a benzodiazepine, but not the two of them. And it's, it's a hell of a choice for some people who have been on these medications for years. Well, what, what, they're, what they're getting at, there's, there's, two, there's two sources of, uh, that they're working from. One is called the Beer, Beers Report. And the Beers Report is about 
anybody over 50 shouldn't take these any of these drugs together and and um most most everything over 50 is is you can't take two of anything but the biggest red flags is back to the dea again the dea observes what addicts and diverters holy trinity for for addicts is is uh, oxycodone soma and xanax and the dea in their infinite wisdom says well addicts take those together to get high disregard the fact that they take six eight ten times the dose of each mm. then anybody who gets those three prescriptions there can't be any valid medical necessity for those because that's what addicts do and and um again it's it's threats from the dea you know they they, they I, I had a i had a pharmacist had his own store outside of orlando and one day he said two, two, two dea agents came in and said you're not to fill any controlled substance in this i forgot what was this area near your store or this zip code near your store no controlled substance you don't, you don't fill any controlled substance for any address in that in that area Based on science, right? Based on based on DEA science. Yes. God bless. Mm -hmm. We just received another question from Katie who asked, what can we do? What can pain warriors do, CPRS warriors do when a physician wants to titrate down and the person, the warrior is just not ready? Well, first, first thing I would do is ask the doctor, what level of pain do you expect me to live or exist in if it's great healthcare professionals do not like my pain chart i have an iffy back it doesn't like to work it doesn't like to do manual labor um my pain scale is if it's five or less it's tolerable if it's above five or less more than five it's intolerable so when they what's your pain i said what's well, tolerable today and they go what what number i said it's less than five choose one or if it's intolerable, what does that mean? It says it's more than five. Choose one. You can't you can't make out between a seven or an eight or a six and a five and you know that that kind of situation. Um, I'm recommending to patients right now when they when they start down this path because the doctor's not going to take no for an answer um, is start keeping track of their blood pressure and their heart rate because I can almost guarantee it will start going up. And, um, and then, because the target with blood pressure is 135 or 85 max. So when you go above that range, you're in a hypertensive area. I've, I've talked to a lot of patients uh, when, when their meds are cut back, even if they're put on four, four different antihypertensive drugs. Um, their blood pressure is north of 200 over 100. That's stroke territory. That, that's, that's, that, that's in, in, and as I said, that's, that's a silent killer. They're still talking about being a silent killer. Always has been. So um, you just need to document in, 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 in medicine, uh, there's a phrase, if it wasn't documented, it didn't happen. So the patient needs to start documenting their blood pressure and their pain levels and make a chart out of it. You can, if you use a spreadsheet, you can make a spreadsheet, you'll make a chart real easy. Just put the numbers in a column and tell what you want to make a chart out of it. And doctors are used to going to charts. I think, I've been talking to some people, if I can find somebody that, that, that knows somebody in a hospital that has a medical school um, that can, uh, with a math department, that maybe we can find a, um, in the, a master's in math, math in statistics or, or a doctoral candidate in statistics that can go through the medical records of the hospital and pull off um, anybody who has untreated, under or untreated pain, it's a straight line to Addison's. Um, the, only, the only thing you don't know for sure is the time it takes from start to be there because the body tries to compensate for the stress by producing more and more cortisone 
and eventually the adrenals fail because you've overstressed them and you got a, you got a patient anis, Addison's and, and that can kill you. Um, so if you start looking at some parameters of, of people that have an ICD-10 for chronic pain and, and maybe an ICD-10 for Addison's and then start pulling off their lab values that are near the low end or, or near or below the low end at or above the high end, I think we'll see some correlation between their level of pain and those lab values. We will have something statistically to qualify their, their intensity of their pain. Their blood pressure is one, that's for sure. But there's some other stuff, and I bet two bits of nickel, it's in the endocrine system. That's where the, where the, the hormones are going to show up or not show up if they're too low. So, that's a uh, good study in the future, but um, I, I like the idea of charting your blood pressure and your pain level over time. And, and heart rate. And heart rate. And heart rate. Yeah, and heart rate. yeah that's excellent. And now can we actually talk a little bit about health insurance and their interaction with pain meds? We actually just had someone say that their insurance is now stepping in as to how long they can use current medication. Where do we think this is going in the future? Well, <laughs> <Is it> going... <laughs> first of all, nothing, a denial from the insurance company is not in concrete. They have an appeal process. It used to be if you, they wouldn't tell you they had an appeal process unless you asked and then they sent you this stuff in writing. Now it's probably a web, website, but you follow that to the letter. And um, if, if they're on Medicare or Part D or Medicare Advantage type situation, um, they give you three levels and then they say they're done with you. They've, they've, they've rejected three times except when you tell them that you're gonna take it to administrative law judge appeal and they go, you're gonna do what? Um, and 50, at least 50% 50 of the people that go that level, it doesn't cost them a thing to do it, just their time and trouble, uh, will get approved. I've never lost an appeal. <laughs> but you, nothing's in concrete. Yeah, is there a, a pharmacist in Congress? Is there is there what? Is there a pharmacist in Congress? We talked about all the lawyers. Yeah, there's one. There's one from Georgia. He's in the House, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to remember what his name is. Uh, have you dialogued with him? No, I mean I'm, I'm out of his territory. I don't vote. You know, I'm not able to vote for him, so he don't care about me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even get my senator to respond to me, and I I have a chance to vote for him. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think of his name. If, if you could figure that out and just send it to us later, that might be okay. enough. I said he's Eastern Georgia, and he's in the House, so it can't be that many House members from Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> what recommendations do you have for chronic pain warriors, CRPS warriors who? of course, have to go to the emergency room, go to the hospital frequently. I know we're always working to educate physicians. We also have medical cards that they can bring with them, but it's very like discouraging whenever CRPS warriors go to the hospital and you know they see their physicians or maybe not their physicians, but they see physicians Googling CRPS. Yeah, they, <laughs> um, they, they probably have little or no knowledge about it. And, um, you know, uh, if you ask them what the McGill pain scale was, and they go, what? What's the McGill pain scale? You, you know what that is, don't you? No, you don't? Of course. Huh? Of course. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, so, you know, they, they don't know it's the theoretical suicide disease. Um, you know, and, and there is a, there on, on the front page of my blog, uh, there's a chart there that, that's been out for since 11, I think. It came out of some medical journal. That's all the potential complications of comorbidity issues for under untreated pain. And um, there's, also, there's also a graphic on there now about the, the, the complications of hypertension. Because uh, 
you know, that's what I would do with the doctor and go, okay, doc, my blood pressure is going to go up. This chart here says what I, I may add these comorbidity issues or they may get complicated or I may end up having eye damage or kidney damage or a stroke or, or what have you, heart attack. Um, is, is this where we're, is this where you want me to go? You know, they, they don't, they don't like people that call their intelligence, particularly when you're right, you know, so, um, it, it's just, um, if you start, and I said, if you start bringing charts with you, you know, scan it down your phone, you know, so you can send it to their printer when you're there or, or what have you, or, or if you got a tablet, just pull my blog up on a tablet. Um, and and you, you just have to, they don't feel your pain. That That's that's the bottom line. And, and um, they've got um, our PCP, who we've went to for 25 plus years. When we first started going to that office, there was six male physicians in there. It was independently owned, pretty high tech. You were one of the first ones playing electronic medical records. And uh, back in 12 or 13, uh, they were sold, to, we're, we're a one hospital county. And they were sold to the, the local hospital and our PCP have told me before it was even public knowledge. He said, I saw more patients last year than I ever saw before made 40 grand less. We're selling the practice to the hospital. About three or four years later, they sold it to a big hospital in Louisville. There, he is now the only physician out of the original six that's still there. And a lot of times when I'm there, we talk shop. And one day, and I, I asked him one day, I said, what are you doing about chronic pain patients? He said, well, we're not taking on any new ones. And I said, they're not, in, they're discouraging from doing that. I said, I understand you're just an employee now. And uh, he told me, he said, if anything goes sideways around here, you're the first person I'm calling. I know more than anybody around him. <laughs> Dr. Steve, tell people how they could get in touch with you, your blog and et cetera, please. Um, my blog is, is uh, pharmaciststeve.com. Um, my email is on there. My phone number's on there. Um, I, I learned early on with chronic pain patients, you don't leave your phone open all night long. My phone goes into, into do not disturb at about 10 o'clock at night instead of saying there's about 8.30 in the morning because they're up and down. No, I'll just call Steve. You know, <laughs> he's going to talk to. No, you'll talk to my voicemail. I'll get back with you in the morning. Um, I need my beauty sleep. Uh, but um, I get emails. One thing, let me check this here, make sure, because at one point in time, let me go get the front page. The column where my email address is. Yeah, it truncated. No, it wrapped it around now. It's changed it. It used to, it used to truncate the CO. M into C O and half an M. Now it now it wrapped it around so it's on the it's on two lines. My email is so it's all there. Phone lines. It's in the it's in the left hand column. In the right hand column, um, you can sign up for uh, get an email anytime I post anything new. Uh, in the left hand column, there is uh, the last six comments that anybody made in five or six and in, in the last five or six. Uh, posts that I've made. So um, there's, there's only a uh, number of posts or reach or approaching 10,000. So you might get a big thermos of coffee if you're going to start going through it. Um, <laughs> you are so popular. <laughs> <laughs> I've got uh, actually the page counts over, over 2.5 million now. Wow. So hopefully you'll get a few more from our viewers tonight, but we did actually just get no, another no calls question. after nine. No, <laughs> <laughs> we did actually just get another question. And I'm on Eastern time. 
So someone just asked this and you mentioned it about appealing. So when writing an appeal to you know, an insurance company, what's the best way to structure their reply? What's important info to include? Well, the first time you appeal it, the same people that deny it the first time are gonna deny it the second time. So it really doesn't make much difference what you put in there. Um, you know, it's, it's um, uh, and again, the, the, the chart, if you're talking about something with anxiety or, or depression or pain, a chart that shows the complications of comorbidity issues from under untreated pain, I would add, add that with your, with your appeal. Uh, if your blood pressure is up and nobody's doing anything about it, there's a chart on there that shows what high blood pressure side effects are. I put that in there with appeal. You know, it's, it's um, you, you know, you, you, you need to talk about, you know, how long you've been taking it, um, how your quality of life is going to be compromised if you don't have it. Um, you know, you don't want to say that it'll make you suicidal because they'll have, um, where, where you're, where are you people at? You're, you're from where? Well, I mean, you're, okay. Out in Cali Farners, 5150, which is a 72 hour uh, involuntary, uh, uh, in, in Florida, it's called the Baker Act. Um, but you don't want to, you don't want to then pull 5150 on you. <laughs> so, um, but, but, uh, just look at the reason they denied it. Um, one, of the, one of the first ones I had to deal with, with Barr, I, I talked her physician of putting her on a new medication that was off label and they denied it. And I paid for it because I wanted to see if it was gonna work. And they denied my second one and I paid for the second month. And they denied it again and paid for the third month and they denied it again. And so I called him up after the third denial, and um, um, this, this is where my credentials come in. And, and uh, I said, you know, you're going to pay for this sooner or later because uh, we're going to take this to an ALJ hearing, ALJ appeal. And it's not going to be the patient. It's going to be your pharmacist's husband. What do you think your chances of of, of, of prevailing on that appeal three days later they decide to cover it <laughs> well, i think it's very important to get your me the medical professional involved in the appeal too talking about medically necessary well we we've uh, I, i'm loosely affiliated with uh, american pain and, and disability foundation and bob sheehan sharon on there has been working with some kids at vanderbilt that are either cancer or are grossly deformed birth defects. And um, um, he, um, the doctors don't really seem to, to know how to dose the kids. And Bob will send me a text and I'll send him one back. And for the, for the afternoons are with the kids are getting their medicine with the doses I recommended. You know, because one doctor he was talking to um actually through bob out of the office because because when he texted me i texted him back and apparently he read my text out loud to the mother and the and the father and the doctor heard as well and got pissed at what i said um <laughs> but the kid ended up then getting her medicine so that was what was important that so the important that's the goal that's the, yes that's the goal so um it is um uh, but but I'm kind of a unicorn. There's not many pharmacists that are on chronic pain sites. Yeah. Alexis, a couple more questions. Yes, okay. yeah, two more questions. So okay. someone is talking about, you know, they of course hate when doctors leave and they have to start over with a new one. Um, and someone is saying that they may even change their insurance to try to get in with their last doctor who sounds like maybe changed practices. Will switching insurance ever be a problem with continuing a prescription? Well, a lot of insurances right now, uh, I've ran a couple of them with, with January with, with Part D and Medicare Advantage, is their first prescription is treated like an acute pain, like an acute prescription, limit to seven days. Um, and they have to be 
work their way through the, the process to be considered a chronic pain patient. Um, I've seen doctors, I've seen pharmacists that will not look back at a patient's records, will not consider that at all. Um, you know, so it's, it's to a certain degree starting all over again. And again, when you change doctors and they're wanting to upset your apple cart and, uh, okay, doc, what, what level of pain do you expect me to live or exist in? If he's just greater than five, say, nice knowing you, doc. I'll see you later. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to exist in a, in a torturous level of pain. That That's, that's, you know, that's, it's tor- I mean, if, if the war on drugs was, was not just a social war, which it is, it was a real war. Um, the chronic pain people would be prisoners of war and be, and, and, and torturing them would be illegal. And our, our, uh, our great superior court uh, a few years back decided that the Eighth Amendment, um, uh, unreasonable. Um, no punishment, right? No punishment. Right. The Supreme Court decided it only applied to prisoners, jail and prison. Didn't apply to anybody else. Ain't that great? I bet our founding fathers never figured that one out. Didn't see that one coming. But, you know, I, I, I often like, you know, our, our founding fathers granted us life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And they didn't figure out that the stupid Congress was going to try to redefine those privileges, rights, every year. After 245 or 50 years, whatever it had been, Congress still has to pass two to 400 laws a year. <laughs> Alexis. Yeah, so I think our last question for you this evening, okay. what resources are you aware of for those who currently cannot afford their prescription? Something they can just keep in their back pocket. Um, there, are some, there are some manufacturers that provide uh, free meds. Um, it's probably on, maybe on the resource page on my blog, on the tab. If not, drop me an email. I can find it. <laughs> you know? I found a good RX to be a, a fabulous one that uh, my wife has uh, neuropathy. And so she basically uh, got, got it via there where they, insurance wouldn't cover it and it was almost $300 and she got it for $26. Okay. The, the, what I'm looking, what, what I'm looking at is, is it's free meds. I, I worked, uh, my last, my last contract, um, um, one of the, it was with a big respiratory company. Uh, a friend of mine died who owned it and his wife came in and said, come run the company. And one of the guy, he was about 55 or 16 was diabetic. And he's having trouble as if for the prices were not weren't even near what they are now. And he's been in trouble fi- affording his, his, his insulin. And so I got him this, this website and I said, you know, go look, go talk to them. And he came back a few days later and he said, they're going to send me three bottles at a time. Every, every time, I mean, every time I need it, they're going to send me three bottles free. So, you know, those, there's still some of those out there. They got, they got real prolific when right before uh, Part D came, because the farmers were wanting everybody to be on the brand name drugs when Part D kicked in, so they would be paying them that way. So uh, there's still some out there. Um, there's um, also at the, at the, one of the last things on my blog on the resource tab, and I picked that up off of next door or whatever that neighborhood thing is um okay this is uh find food assistance help paying bills and other free or reduced cost programs including new programs for the COVID-19 pandemic and there's like three different websites on that and that's at the very bottom of the page on the resource tab okay that's Good. And I think Alexis, we could put it on as when we put the, the video up, we could also put some resources too for people. 
Definitely. We can definitely do that. Well, that's the oh. resource. That resource tab is, is, has a lot of stuff in it. Yeah. Um, I, I have to, sometimes it has so much stuff, I have to search to find it. Because I put stuff there so I know where it'd be the next time, but I put so much stuff on there, I can't find it in the resource tab. <laughs> you, you've been collecting resources now for so many, for a decade now. It sounds for a decade, like I'm yes. sure you have for many. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I have, but I have more graphics than I have uh, anything else. Now, I only have about 1,500 graphics. I got a huge file of, <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, I got one I like to use routinely. I use, in fact, I use a night sending email. It's a guy with a bullhorn. This is dump the chains. Um. <laughs> well, Dr. Aaron, thank you so much for all this information. This is, I believe, the first time we've had a very conversational Facebook Live. So if you watched here on Facebook or if you're watching the replay on YouTube, definitely let us know what you think. And, you know, we'll consider doing something along these lines in the future. That, that, as I told you, when I wanted to do a Q&A instead of a presentation, because since post-college, I've probably been close to a thousand different professional presentations and probably 80% of them I could care less about. So there's, there's no sense of me putting a presentation together when nobody has, a, has a, the first bit of interest in, in what I'm talking about. If they, I know they all have questions. I get emails every day and Facebook chats every day and, you know, folks, occasional phone calls. Um, so, you know, I know there's questions out there and I'm, I'm glad to answer them when I can. And I'll tell you that you're barking up the wrong tree when you're trying to bark up the wrong tree because there's some things, you know, you're just not going to get past. But um, talking to members of Congress, writing them, um, it, it's it, it's it's just in one ear and out the other because yeah I think they have optical scanners that look for select words and pull out paragraphs and somebody pieces the paragraphs together and sends it out with their signature and that's as close to, and they put a mark on a spreadsheet as to what the letter was about so um, I, I'm, I'm not I don't have much faith in our Congress America applies generally. Yes, I agree. Alexis, yeah. anything you want to talk about the virtual walk for a second? That, uh, yes, I was actually going to see if I needed to pull um, Jerry in. <laughs> I know she's out here on uh, Facebook, but we do have so many great events coming up this spring. Um, I know some we can't really announce yet. We'll keep you mm -hmm. all posted. Some of them are a little secretive, but I know we do have our third annual virtual CRPS awareness walk which is going to take place on June 11th. And I'm actually gonna bring some members of our team onto a future Facebook Live to talk more about it and you know, let everyone know how you can get involved. But keep an eye on our page because I know we're going to be posting about the upcoming um, duck race, the rubber duck race that happens every year in Rhode Island. We're gonna be posting about that and how you can help contribute to that as RCSA will receive some of the benefits. And we are also hosting another paint networking event so we're going to post more about that at the end of this week yeah, but during, during, during we're right here we're in right next to Louisville Kentucky mm -hmm. they have a they have a big duck thing with the derby in the Ohio <laughs> River every year yeah. uh, some kind of fundraiser I forget what it is but but we um, actually the the derby is almost two weeks long it starts with a huge mm -hmm. uh, if you're into fireworks uh Huge 30 minute plus fireworks. Um, uh, Thunder over Louisville. Thank you, Barb. Um, Thunder over Louisville. It's usually about two weeks, the Saturday, two weeks, two Saturdays before the Derby. And then the, the Derby Festival goes all the way through the Derby. And then there's a, a political shindig the next day after the Derby. But we don't even go across the river. It's crazy over there. Um, <laughs> Hopefully, this duck race in Rhode Island will be a little more. Won't be as crazy. <laughs> well, as I said, that that's that's a that's a big thing. You know, the Kentucky Derby, that's a big thing. Right. You know, yeah. it, 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 yeah. it's it's uh, um as a play as I said the across the river gets early and with that with that thunder over global, um both they'll be on both sides of the river. They, all this is is barges out in the river and um in one of the bridges they, they put all kind of fireworks on. And um, uh, it's if it's pretty weather, 
it's done usually have four to five hundred thousand people on both sides of the river. Maybe we'll have that many people on our virtual walk in our next in-person. <laughs> but as always, everyone, we'll have this video pinned to the top of our Facebook timeline for easy access if you want to rewatch it. And we will also add it to YouTube. And if you have any questions for us, if you need a support group, if you're looking for a new physician, um, if you are not sure if you're on our email list, if you're not receiving in rare form that we put out every month, um, be sure to send us an email at info at rcs.org so we can get that fixed for you. And also reach out to us if you are interested in writing for our blog. We are always looking for more stories. We're looking for updates. Even if you've you know, done something on our blog before, you can always write another piece and let everyone know how you're doing. Um, we Would you put my open. email on your list? Would yeah, you put my email? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. definitely do that. All righty. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay. Good night. Take care.